Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On to Huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. What's up, Doc? Here's what's up. Listen, everyone. Here's your chance to get five, yes, five pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books. All new, all yours for only 15 cents and one box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. Stand by for full details later. Dusk was falling one autumn evening as Sergeant Preston rode down the main street of Dawson City. The great dog, King, trotted beside his master's horse. Suddenly, the sergeant heard his name being called out. Sergeant Preston! Hey, Sergeant, wait a minute! Oh, Blackie, oh, fella. Something wrong, Casper? Yeah, yeah, I want to report a robbery. It was that no good Muddy Andrews. He came into my store and stole my gun. What kind of a gun was it? It was a single-action Colt 45 with an ivory grip. Maybe he'd have stolen my money, too, but thank him and my cash drawer was locked. All right, Casper, we'll see if we can't get your gun back. Yeah, thank you. And make sure you put that young loafer where he belongs, in jail. Come on, Blackie. Marty Andrews had no parents. He worked at Ben Davis' livery stable during the day and slept in the loft overhead at night. As Sergeant Preston reined up at the livery stable, he was greeted by Ben Davis. Oh, Buggy. Oh, no. Howdy, Sergeant. Ben, where's Marty? Uh, try the Gold Dust Cafe. That's where he's been spending most of his time lately, hanging around Slick Morgan and his pal Krebs. Thanks, Ben. Come on, Buggy. Goldust Cafe was crowded with sourdoughs and trappers. In one corner of the room, a boy still in his teens sat at a table with two tough-looking men. The boy was saying eagerly, now Listen, Slick, how about taking me along next time you and Krebs pull another job? <laughs> Take you along? <laughs> What's for? Oh, you mean as a mascot? Hey, you ain't even dry behind the ears yet, kid. What would you do if there happened to be any gunplay? I can't take care of myself. I got a gun right here. Hey, he has it there. Let's take a look at that gun, kid. Take a look at something else. Hey, a Mountie. Yeah, it's Sergeant Preston. He's coming right this way. Hey, give me back that gun. <laughs> What's the matter? Are you afraid the law won't let you keep it? Well, well, well. If it isn't the pride of the Mounties and his faithful pooch. <laughs> Say, don't he look pretty in that red coat and all them brass buttons? Let me see that gun you just shoved under your coat, Marty. What for? Belongs to me. You ain't got no right. Hand it over, Marty. I'll leave the kid alone, Preston. Yeah, can't you see? You're making him nervous. That's the trouble with you, Mounties. You look mighty brave in those red coats, but underneath you're too yellow to pick on someone your own size. I'm still waiting for you to hand over that gun, Marty. Maybe you didn't hear what I just said, Preston. I heard what you said. I'll give you a chance to repeat it next time I see you. Right now, my business is with Marty here. All right. Here's the gun. Thanks. Single action, Colt 45 with an ivory grip. Marty, I'm afraid I'll have to arrest you. Arrest me? What for? I ain't done nothing. You stole this gun from Casper Mulheim. <coughs> Who says I did? Mulheim says that. He's lying. He's always had it in for me, that big Now, look, rat... Marty, you'll have a chance to tell your side of the story, but you'll have to do it at headquarters. Why don't you come along quietly and not make any trouble? Yes, you better do like he says, kid. Okay. I'll go along with you, Preston. 
But you wouldn't be acting so cool if it was Slick you had to arrest instead of me. You know, Preston, I think he's right. Maybe you'll have a chance to find out one of these days, Slick. Come on, Marty. At Mounted Police Headquarters, Marty first tried to brazen out the situation. But he soon broke down and confessed when confronted by the man he had robbed. Sergeant Preston tried hard to win the boy's confidence only to be met by an attitude of sullen resistance. Marty, believe me, I want to be your friend. Ah, don't make me laugh. How can anyone be friends with a cop? Now, look, it doesn't matter whether you hate me or trust me. Figure it out for yourself. This is the fourth time you've been in trouble with the police. If you keep on this way, you're sure to wind up with a long stretch behind bars. Wouldn't it be smarter to go straight and avoid all that? I suppose I should follow my father's example, huh? What do you mean? He went straight, and where did it get him? He couldn't land a decent job because people always found out he'd been in prison. So he lived in filthy tenements, never had enough to eat. When Mother got sick, he couldn't even pay for an operation I might have saved her life. Then he got the bright idea of coming up here to the Yukon. To look for gold? <laughs> yeah, to look for gold. Six months he spent freezing out in the bush, and all he got was a bad case of typhoid fever. Just barely had strength enough to crawl back to Dawson and die. So instead of following your dad's example, you'd rather take Slick Morgan as your model, is that it? You bet I would. He's smart and he's tough. Nobody makes a sucker out of him. Doesn't occur to you that your father was twice the man Slick Morgan will ever be? Ah, what are you talking about? Slick Morgan's like every other criminal. He's never quite grown up. He's like a spoiled baby who thinks he can grab anything he wants. Your dad was no baby. He was willing to work hard for what he wanted, and he never quit trying, even when the brakes went against him. Don't you suppose that took courage? Ah, uh, hooey. All right, Marty, I won't argue with you. Maybe there's some other way of changing your mind. The following day, Sergeant Preston discussed Marty's case with Inspector Maynard. Inspector, suppose we could find someone who'd be willing to take custody of the boy. Someone who'd give him a decent home and set him some kind of an example. I have an idea Marty might get a different slant on things. Well, that's a pretty tall order. Well, what about Pop McIntosh, sir? Pop McIntosh? Why, Thunder Sergeant, you may have something there. Should I talk to Pop and see what he thinks of the idea? Do that, Sergeant. If you can get him interested in the boy, I'll go to the commissioner and have Marty paroled to Pop's custody. Pop McIntosh was an elderly traitor beloved by all who knew him, both whites and Indians. When Sergeant Preston asked him if he'd be willing to take custody of Marty Andrews for a six-month period and thus saved the boy from a jail sentence, Pop readily agreed. Several days later, the sergeant and Marty arrived at Pop's trading post about ten miles north of Dawson City. Pop, I'd like you to meet your new assistant, Marty Andrews. Oh, you're the young fellow that's going to move in with me, eh? It wasn't my idea. It wasn't mine either, but I reckon it's a good idea just same. You know, I'm kind of looking forward to having someone keep me company here at the post. Now, look... You think you're going to get any work out of me, you got another thing coming. Marty? Ah, that's all right, it's all right, son. Suppose you take your duffel now and go on inside the post. The sergeant and me will be in just as soon as I show him some new furs I've got hanging up out in the shed. Uh, all right. Sorry he's starting out this way, Bob. Oh, shucks, that don't bother me none, sergeant. He's feeling mad at everybody right now, and he's got to take it out somewhere. He'll change when we get to know each other better. In spite of himself, Marty soon grew to like and respect the old trader, and he willingly performed his share of the work around the trading post. But outwardly, he remained as sullen and uncooperative as ever. One day, Marty was alone at the counter when an Indian entered. Oh. What do you got there, Redskin? Me bring two fox skin. Uh, how much you want for him? Me want food. Want money, too. Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? These mangy pelts aren't worth more than ten bucks apiece. And you expect they get grubbed, too, on top of that. Go on, get out of here. Well, hello there, Charlie. Haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, me glad you here. So, you brought me a couple of fox skins, eh? Uh, me, been sick. Not able, ten traps. Maybe bring more skin later. Sure, sure you will. Well, what do you want for these pelts, Charlie? Money? Food? Cloth? Uh... Me want food. Need money, too. Need $50. Oh, 
How come? You ain't going to spend it on fire water, are you? No, no. Me been sick. Now squaw sick, papu sick. Me got go Dawson, get white doctor. In that case, you can have whatever you want. Uh. I'll go back to the safe and get the money right now. And if 50 ain't enough, you come back and I'll lend you some more. Pop McIntosh went into the back room. He stooped down before the safe and began to twist the dial. He didn't hear Marty Andrews enter the room softly and stand a short distance behind him, watching him work the combination. Then, just as the safe door swung open, Marty shifted his weight and a board creaked. But, Marty, I didn't know you were standing there. Why, I just came in. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I just think you're crazy, giving that engine so much money, that's all. Don't you realize every redskin's a natural-born liar? Now, now, look, son. The color of a man's skin ain't got nothing to do with how honest he is. I know I can trust Charlie, just like I knew I could trust you first time I ever laid eyes on you. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Yo, ho, ho! Bugs Bunny hunts buried treasure while a swaggering two-gun pirate hunts Bugs Bunny. Who wins out? You'll find out, fellas and girls, in Bugs Bunny and Buried Treasure. It's just one of five. Yes, I said five Bugs Bunny comic books that are yours if you act quickly. Yours for only 15 cents and one box top from a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. It's the greatest offer ever made by these famous ready-to-serve breakfast cereals shot from guns. You've seen Bugs, the famous carrot-chomping bunny in the movies, on the radio, in the comics. <coughs> What's up, Doc? But you've never seen or read these handy pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books. You can't get them anywhere else. They're just off the presses. They're all new. They're all different. They're all complete. Just think. Five different stories, 32 full-color pages in each book, 160 pages in the set of five. 160 pages crammed full of fun, excitement, thrills, mystery, adventure. Wow, Doc, what an offer. For instance, just listen to the titles of the exciting books you get in set C. Bugs Bunny Fights the Man from Mars. Bugs Bunny Secret Agent. Bugs Bunny Lost in the Frozen North. Bugs in the Haunted Cave. Bugs Bunny Captured by Cannibals. Yes, we'll send you a set of five books, and we'll let you know how easy it is to get ten more Bugs Bunny comic books. Now, here's all you do. Just go to your grocer, buy a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Then cut off the top of the package, write your name and address on it, and send it along with 15 cents, only 15 cents, to Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Don't wait. This offer won't last. Look, Doc, you better hurry. The sooner you send, the better. And we'll rush you a complete set of five Bugs Bunny comic books. Send only 15 cents in coin, your name and address, and one box top from a package of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Then mail to Bugs Bunny... Chicago 77, Illinois. I'll give you that address again, so listen. It's Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Now to continue our story. Several weeks after Marty Andrews went to live with Pop McIntosh, the old trader made the trip into Dawson City. Marty accompanied him. After helping Pop dispose of his pelts, Marty went to the Gold Dust Cafe, hoping to find Slick Morgan and his pal Krebs. Sure enough, the two crooks were seated at their usual table. Well, look who's here. <laughs> Marty Andrews, the big bad guns. Now listen, how would you two guys like to cut in on $5,000? Five, stop. <laughs> there he goes again, getting them big ideas. Quit making fun of me, you big baboon. That face of yours is funny enough. Why, you little punk. I'll... Shut up, Cribs. I think the kid's serious. Doggone right, I'm serious. What do you got in mind? Pop McIntosh is drawing 5,000 bucks out of the bank today. 
He's taking it back to the post. So he'll have enough cash on hand to buy the furs the trappers bring in. Keep talking. A couple of days ago, when Pop was opening the safe, I sneaked up behind and watched over his shoulder. I memorized the combination. You mean you can open the safe yourself now? I know doggone well I can. I tried it once when Pop wasn't around. Hey, kid. You're smarter than I thought. When did you figure we might pull this job? What's wrong with tonight? Well, what do you think of my idea? I think it's plenty smart. You can count us in. Later that afternoon, as Pop McIntosh emerged from the Dawson City Bank, he caught sight of Sergeant Preston approaching on horseback. Well, hello there, Sergeant. Hello, Pop. Hope I gave you a fella. Easy. Just uh, going into the bank? I know. As a matter of fact, I was looking for you. Oh, how come? I just ran into Ben Davis. Told me he saw Marty in the Gold Dust Cafe talking to Slick Morgan, his pal Krebs. Oh. Ben said the three of them had their heads pretty close together, so they were talking something over. Incidentally, is that a money bag you brought out of the bank? Yep, that's right. Just drew out $5,000. Does Marty know you're drawing out that much money? Well, yeah. Stop to think of it, he does. Hey, you ain't suggesting that Marty might be planning to rob me, are you? I'm not suggesting anything, Pop. It might not hurt to be on your guard. Just to be on the safe side, I think I'll have the city patrol locate Morgan and Krebs and keep them under surveillance. It was nearing 10 o'clock when Pop and Marty arrived at the post. In the moonlit darkness, they saw a man seated on the low open porch that extended out in front of the post. Hold there, Bessie girl. Hold there, fool. Looks like somebody's waiting for us. Yeah, you're right. By thunder, it's my Indian friend, Charlie. Oh, me bring you more skin. Oh, let's see, let's see here. Two beaver skins and the wolverine pelt. By juniper, this wolverine's worth $100 by itself. Ah. Come on inside, and I'll figure out how much you got coming to you. Oh, me not want nothing. You good friend. You give food, lend money when me need it. Now you keep skin. But looky here now, these pelts are worth a <laughs> no, lot. No, no, me give you skins for present, huh? No take money. Me go now. Oh, wait. Well, I'll be horn swallowed. Marty, it just goes to show you. People may sneer at you and call you soft-hearted for following the golden rule. But if you ask me, it's just plain good business sense. Pop and Marty unloaded the pack mule and led her into the stall. Then they went inside the trading post. Pop lit the lamp. As Marty turned and started up the ladder leading to the second floor, Pop said, Wait a minute, Marty. What's the matter? There, <clears throat> something I've been meaning to talk to you about. Yeah? What is it? Marty, it gets pretty lonely around the post sometimes. You've been a mighty big help to me since you've been here. I was wondering what you might think of the idea of me adopting you as my son. Adopting me? That's right. You see, I used to have a boy of my own. Not much older than you are right now. He went with the Rough Riders, got killed on Cuba. Maybe Sergeant Preston didn't tell you that. Uh, no. No, he didn't. <clears throat> well, do you think you might be willing to have me for a foster pop? What? Well, Gosh, I don't know what to say. Well, shucks, you don't have to make up your mind right away. You take your time, think it over. No sense rushing into things. Meanwhile, back in Dawson City, Slick Morgan and his pal Krebs were preparing to ride out to the trading post. Unknown to the two crooks, a police constable had been watching their cabin ever since nightfall. A few minutes after they left the cabin, the constable burst into Sergeant Preston's office at Mounted Police Headquarters. Sergeant, Morgan and Krebs just rode out of town. They had an extra horse with them. Which way they go? They headed north. That means they could be heading for Pop's trading post. Come on, King, we've got to tell them. First we'll go to their cabin and get their scent. It was nearing midnight when Slick Morgan and Krebs headed their horses up the thickly wooded valley that led to the trading post. Slick, I still think someone may be trailing us. All right, all right. Listen, where do we get up on that rise at the end of the valley? We'll get off our horses and take a little look-see. There's plenty of moonlight. If anyone's following our trail, we'll be sure to spot them from up there. Get up, boy. Come on. Get up. A 
short time later, the two men were lying flat in the underbrush, looking down into the valley. Their horses were tethered out of sight in a thick grove of trees. Uh, come on, we're wasting our time. You can see for yourself no one's following us. Wait a minute. Someone's coming up the trail right now. Look down there, just past that clump of cottonwoods. Hey, you're right. It's a guy on horseback. My thunder. He looks like a mountie to me. What are we going to do? Now listen, if I remember right, the trail takes a nice sharp turn just before we get to the trading post. One of us can go on and get the kid in the money. The other one can stay behind and pick himself out a real nice hiding place right by that turn in the trail. Yeah? What happens when that guy that's trailing us comes along? He gets a bullet right between the eyes. Meanwhile, inside the trading post, Marty Andrews had gotten out of bed and made his way softly to the back room where the safe stood. First, he unbarred the back door. Then he lit a candle and went over to the safe. His fingers fumbled nervously with the dial. In spite of his bold resolutions, Marty had lost all taste for the job. Somehow he couldn't still the voice of his conscience. Worse yet, he couldn't help thinking of how Pop would feel when he discovered the crime in the morning. Suddenly, as the safe door swung open... Marty! Pop! Now listen, I, I can explain, Pop. There's no need to explain anything, Marty. If you need that money in the safe, go ahead and take it. What? I'm just sorry you didn't come to me first and ask uh, for it. Ask for it? Certainly, I told you I wanted to adopt you, didn't I? Oh, well, yeah, no but... No buts about it now. If I'm going to be your foster pop, we've got to trust each other completely. Who else would you go to with your problems? Put up your hands. What's it? Say, who are you? Sorry, but I ain't got no time for formal introductions. The kid knows who I am, don't you, Marty? I'll say I do, Slick. What? Man alive, you sure showed up at the right time. Yeah, what's the matter? The old man wake up and catch you in the air? Yeah. Darn near scared me out of my wits. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet he did. Well, he won't make no trouble now that I'm here. Yeah, see, you got the safe open. Yeah. There's more in it than I thought. Beside the 5,000, there's a couple of pokes full of gold hey, dust. Hey, now, ain't that nice? Guess maybe I'd better go over and take charge of that stuff right now. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? matter. Pop's a pretty tricky old guy. If you're going to clear out the safe, you better let me hold that gun on him. Yeah, yeah I guess maybe you're right. Here, you take the gun. <laughs> sure you know how to handle that thing, kid. <laughs> Darn right I do. Put up your hands. Hey, what is this, a joke? You'll find out if you don't get your hands up. What's a big idea? The idea is I've changed my mind. There's not going to be any robbery. Marty, Marty, I knew all along you were no crook. I'm sorry, Pop. I'm sorry about everything. Marty was looking you know, at Pop McIntosh. Slick sudden out. movement caught him off guard. Get, I'll take that gun. No, no you don't. No. So you're feeling scrappy. Yeah. Now I'll take this. Why oh. are you ornery police? Stay yet? put, you old goat, or this gun will go off right in your face. I'm all right, Pop. Listen, Slick Morgan, you can't get away with this. Who's going to stop? I'll tell you who. Sergeant Preston. He suspected you might be up to some kind of dirty work, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't trail you here from Dawson. Oh, so that's who was found us, huh? <laughs> What's so funny? Listen, for your information, Sergeant Preston's going to get a little surprised. What, uh, what do you mean? I mean he's going to walk right into a trap. My pal Krebs is waiting for him at the bend on the trail. When Preston shows up, Krebs will gun him down. <laughs> Did you hear that? That means Sergeant Preston is knocking on the pearly gates right now. You low down It murdering. also means I'm going to have to do away with you and the kid here so you can't squeal on us. But first, I'll clear out the safe. Slick Morgan went over to the safe and reached one hand inside. With his other hand, he kept his gun trained on Pop and Marty. First, he extracted the bundle of bills. Then he groped around for the gold which Marty had mentioned. Hey, where those pokes of gold that you were talking about? There are none. I just said that to fool you. Yeah, yeah, and you fell for it. You, the great Slick Morgan. Muttonhead Morgan, that's what they ought to call you. Why, you old goat, I'll fix you. you. The back door was standing open. As Slick rushed toward Pop McIntosh, he didn't see the great dog that suddenly sprang at him from the doorway. Where'd this dog come from? Up that gun, Morgan. I'll, I'll drop it. That's funny. All right, King, you can let him up now, boy. How did you get by Krebs? I thought he'd taken care of you. Yes, I know you did. Fortunately, King warned me that someone was waiting around the bend in the trail. What about that shot we heard? Krebs' gun went off and King sprang at him. Right now, he's waiting outside, handcuffed to the hitch rail. You're both under arrest in the name of the Queen. Marty, looks like I'll have to put you under arrest again. No, no, you won't, Sergeant. 
The boys had a change of heart. Wait till I tell you. Eagerly, Pop explained how Marty had tried to prevent the crime which he had planned. Marty, that's the best news I've heard in a long time. You'll have to stand trial along with Slick and Krebs. But when the judge hears what you did, I'm pretty sure he'll parole you back to Pop. I think you've learned by now that crime doesn't pay. <laughs> you should have been a preacher, Preston. Slick, the last time I saw you, you made a certain remark. I told you I'd give you a chance to repeat it. Maybe you'd like to do that right now. You're mighty brave, aren't you, with that gun in your hand and that dog to back you up? Bob, suppose you take care of both these guns for a few minutes? Yeah, well, what are you going to do, Sergeant? I'm going to show Marty that Slick Morgan's not quite the man he's cracked up to be. King, go on over in the corner and stay there. Go on, fella. Over there in the corner. Lie down. All right, Morgan. Suppose you repeat that remark. You bet I'll repeat it. Preston, you're yellow. Oh, what a beauty. Why, you... Give it to him, Sergeant. Slick Morgan had a bull-like strength which had given him mastery over many men. But in Sergeant Preston, he found a different kind of opponent. A man with skilled fists and lightning speed. Time after time, the sergeant stopped his rushes with a well-placed punch. Until at last, a smashing right sent him sprawling on the floor unconscious. Sergeant, you sure took care of him. Man alive, Sergeant. I bet that's the last time he ever tries to get tough with a money. Yes, Marty, I think this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Page after page after page of excitement, mystery, laughs, thrills. That's what Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice will send you. Actually, 160 pages of Bugs Bunny comics. Actually, five different pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books. All yours for only 15 cents and one box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat or Rice. The stories are all new, just off the presses. You've never seen or read them before. Here are just a few. Bugs Bunny finds Aladdin's lamp. Bugs Bunny joins the Marines. Bugs Bunny meets the dwarf ghost. Yes, the more you read, the more you want. And we'll not only send you five different books, we'll also send you full information on how easy it is to get ten more. Look, Doc, you better hurry. Yes, as Bugs Bunny says, don't wait till it's too late. Send for yours today. Send only 15 cents in coin, not stamps. That's all, just 15 cents and your name and address. Send with one box top from a package of delicious, crisp, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Address your letter to Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Write down that address right away. Here it is. Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of The Last Will. When King and I were in Caribou Creek, we called an old Peter Bailey and learned that he'd sent for Terry Quinn, a young man he'd not seen for a quarter of a century. I didn't suspect that within a short time I would find Terry accused of attempting to kill old Pete. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker.